Thank you. Yes, and I echo all the thanks uh, uh, and gratitude for this uh, fabulous conference and to be here in Germany. Uh, so on September 8th, 1800, a visitor to Dresden, a certain 12-year-old Arthur Schopenhauer, wrote of his visit with his parents to the Zwinger court built by Friedrich Augustus, the elector of Saxony. And in particular, he wrote, and you can read the German on your own, he was impressed by a display of various things relating to the Jewish religion, including a wooden model of Solomon's temple, and many old Jewish books written very nicely with Hebrew letters on parchment and rolled up. These uh, rolled Jewish books, which we can identify as Torah and Esther scrolls, had actually originally been assembled along with other uh, items of ritual Judaica by a Jewish convert to Christianity named Christoph Walich, who had built a model synagogue in 1708 in Greifswald for the Lutheran theologian Johann Friedrich Meyer. Uh, this synagogue, uh, model synagogue, was eventually acquired by the University of Leipzig and then uh, by the court of Friedrich Augustus, uh, where it was put on display until it was dissolved in the 19th century. And the two objects which you see on the screen are the only surviving elements, uh, as far as I know, from this collection, which have survived the wooden temple model, which is, uh, uh, you see on the left now, in uh, Hamburg. Uh, and the uh, scroll in the University of Leipzig. Uh, what I would like to focus uh, your attention on uh, for the moment is these scrolls, these Jewish scrolls which Schopenhauer thought were so nicely written, uh, to consider the larger context which shaped the collection, circulation, and display of Jewish scrolls in early modern German collections and generally in early modern Europe. This is part of a larger book project that I'm working on at the moment, which uh, emerges from, but is actually separate from the dissertation project on North African books, which uh, you uh, heard about. Um, so this current project investigates the changing meanings of Torah scrolls as they move between Christian and Jewish communities, usually from Jewish to Christian communities, uh, and sometimes rarely back in the other direction. Uh, combining historical and ethnographic research, I hope, to explore how Christian ideas about Jews and Judaism have shaped their interactions with Jewish texts and our own understandings of the history of the book uh, from the earliest debates about uh, scrolls and codices between Jews and Christians in late antiquity to Christian scholars in early modern Europe, which I'll speak about today, and evangelical collectors in contemporary America, which is uh, sort of the next part which I'm working on now. So uh, I will focus on the movement of Torah scrolls in Germany between the 16th and 19th century using as a guiding set of examples the scrolls that are found here in the collection of the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin. Uh, and this investigation uh, highlights three genres of collecting which I will examine consecutively. Obviously, the collectors and institutions that I'll speak about here are not unique, uh, but part of uh, broader intellectual networks that stretched across Germany, across Europe, and even beyond. Um, and so I will make even some occasional reference to scrolls in collections outside of Germany, if you will forgive me. So the first period begins with the rise of Christian Hebraism and the focused study of Hebrew and Jewish texts by European Christian scholars. Often this was part of the study of Oriental languages, and thus, uh, uh, so to speak, and thus, as we shall see, Jewish manuscripts became part of Oriental collections, even if they themselves originated not geographically from the Orient, but rather among local German or Central European Jewish communities, in other words, uh, Ashkenazim. So these Ashkenazi scrolls were used not to gain insight into local German Jewish history or communities, but rather into the biblical text and the Hebrew language itself. And the earliest example that I know of is a Torah scroll uh, donated to the Tübingen University Library by the Hebraist Konrad Sumenhart, uh, which we know was used by Konrad Pelikan to study Hebrew as early as 1501. But unfortunately, this scroll was destroyed during a library fire in 1534, so it no longer exists. Um, but another ex similar example is this scroll that you see on the left, which is now in the Forschungsbibliothek Gotha, um, which was acquired by Duke Ernst uh, I, Ernst der Frommen, from the Nordhausen City Council in 1658. And as you can see, it has been annotated in Latin by at least one early modern user, uh, probably a Christian Hebraist of some sort. 
For the most part, though, Christian Hebraists of the 16th and 17th centuries did not extensively collect or study Torah scrolls, focusing more on either codices of the Bible or manuscripts of post-biblical Jewish literature. But the scroll did hold significance in their minds as the truest and most authentic copy of Hebrew uh, scripture. Scholars of Jewish practice in their description of scrolls emphasized the many laws surrounding the accuracy of the text and the seemingly unchanging nature of this technological format. For example, in 1672, Johannes Saubert described the Torah scroll at the Universität Helmstedt, which is now in the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, and that's the scroll you see in the center. Uh, he describes it as being even older than the oldest Hebrew manuscripts in England, uh, since, as he writes, quote, this scroll is very ancient and is said to have been written even before the birth of Christ, which, of course, is not true, but this is the idea that um, this scroll suggested to him. Similarly, when Johann Christoph Wagensal presented an Esther scroll, which was almost certainly written and illuminated in Italy in the 17th century, to the library of the University of Altdorf in 1705, he claimed that it was the oldest Hebrew manuscript in the world. In the 18th century, this tendency led to Christian biblical scholars seeking out Torah scrolls as tools for preparing critical editions of the Hebrew Bible. The famed medieval Erfurt scrolls, which since 1880 have been here at the Staatsbibliothek, were consulted by Johann Heinrich Michaelis in 1720 as he was preparing his edition of the Biblia Hebraica, which you see on the left, along with the scroll that I just mentioned in Helmstadt, uh, and another, another old uh, scroll in the Halle of Marien Bibliothek. And the oldest scrolls that are here uh, uh, in the Staatsbibliothek's collection uh, are also examples of this. The scroll is now uh, Oriental Folio 133 and 134, uh, which you see in the middle, uh, were mentioned by Johann Christoph Wolf in his 1721 Bibliotheca Hebrea as among the treasures of the Royal Library. And uh, some few decades later, when the English scholar Benjamin Kennicott was compiling his own edition of biblical textual variants, he examined or asked his colleagues to examine over two dozen uh, old Torah scrolls in Germany, England, France, and Italy, including these two scrolls, the Helmstadt and the Halle scrolls that I already mentioned. It is around this time in the mid-1700s uh, that we begin to see the coalescing of what I identify as the second approach to the Torah scroll, so the first being its use as a scholarly tool, the second uh, approach to the Torah scroll, namely its use as a visual symbol of Judaism. This is part of the larger development of an ethnographic interest in contemporary Jewish culture and also manifest in the collecting of Jewish objects and the display of Judaica uh, in noble and princely collections. So part of the motivation for this is that while these objects were still seen as quintessentially ancient in their form, they also became representatives of the contemporary Jewish communities who produced and used them. So more than their possible antiquity or scholarly value, the Torah scrolls took on a new significance as visual representations of authentic Judaism, appearing in royal libraries, in Kunstkammeren, and other noble collections. In some cases, these displays were meant to serve an explicitly pedagogical function, such as the model synagogue that we began with that was assembled by Christoph Wallich. Similarly, when the, univers when the University of Uppsala uh, uh, decided to assemble its own uh, sort of model synagogue, the librarian requested the necessary funds, explaining to the chancellor that these Jewish objects uh, are used successfully in his own teaching and that, uh, and I quote here from his letter, such objects can only be wrung from the Jews by pleas and payment, yet they are vital and serve to explain the Old and New Testaments in very many places. And you see on the left the list of objects which uh, they requested at Uppsala. Um, although they do not survive, to my knowledge. In other cases, Torah scrolls were part of a focused grouping of objects meant to illustrate Jewish culture, uh, a kind of Juden cabinet, alongside exotic objects from other foreign cultures and peoples around the world, such as was recommended by Linhard Christoph Sturm in the early 18th century, as you see in the quotation from the in the center. To bring together uh, uh, these uh, objects, Torah scrolls, and other uh, uh, Jewish objects to form a kind of display of Judaism. We might suppose, for example, that the Torah scroll, which is uh, now Oriental Folio 442 here at the Staatsbibliothek, gifted to the Royal Library in the mid-18th century by Ludwig Ferdinand Count von Schulenberg-Oyenhausen, 
uh, was probably valued not as a scholarly resource, but as an illustration of Jewish customs, and perhaps was even originally acquired with the intention of serving in such a Juden cabinet display. Uh, other Christian collectors, particularly as we move into the 19th century, had a slightly different motivation. Uh, since the unchanging nature, or so they imagined, of the Torah scroll made it the perfect object to create a visual material connection to biblical antiquity and the time of Jesus. So in this model, contemporary Jews and their books uh, serve not as examples of themselves, but as stand-ins for the Israelites of antiquity. A Torah scroll from 18th century Germany or 19th century Morocco was functionally equivalent to the imagined scroll of first century Palestine. As one such American collector, the Bostonian merchant and congregationalist uh, named S. Brainerd Pratt explained in 1891, and I quote from one of his essays, being the superintendent of a Sunday school, I desired to show the teachers how the Bible was made in the days of the prophets. For this, I wanted a Jewish role. A Jewish role, however, ancient or modern, proved to be a hard thing to procure. And Pratt goes on to lament that even after applying to a number of leading Hebrews in Boston to beg, borrow, or buy a scroll from one of the synagogues, he, excuse me, he met with no success. And finally, after much uh, searching, was able to acquire a scroll from the New Testament scholar, Kaspar René Gregory at the University of Leipzig. He, Gregory had apparently bought it from a rabbi in uh, what is today Western Poland in Poznan. And you see that's the scroll that's in the center of the image. Eventually Pratt acquired many, uh, several other scrolls and put them together in this little display that you see on the right. Finally, in the late 18th century, this is the third, uh, Facet. Finally, in the late 18th century, we begin to see the influence of Orientalism and tourism and travel leading to the acquisition of Torah scrolls from Jewish communities in North Africa or the Middle East. Until now, almost all of the scrolls uh, that I've mentioned and scrolls held in European collections originated from local European Jewish communities. One of the first examples of what we might call a truly oriental scroll entering a European collection is the scroll uh, that you see on the right, a scroll from Egypt acquired by August Johann Buxdorf in 1746 and donated to him to the Basel Universitätsbibliothek, where it uh, still is today. Universities, uh, other universities and libraries in Berlin, Göttingen, Kassel, Leipzig, Erfurt, Vienna, and other institutions across Europe uh, all contain, at least according to my database so far, scrolls or scroll fragments purchased in the 18th and 19th centuries as souvenirs in Palestine, Egypt, North Africa, and the Ottoman Empire. For example, the Forschungsbibliothek Gotha also contains a number of scroll fragments donated by Professor Adalbert Merckx, who uh, claimed to have uh, acquired them from some kind of Geniza uh, in the Middle East. The German missionary Johann Rudolf Lieder also collected many Arabic and Coptic manuscripts serving in Cairo, as well as claiming to have found a Torah scroll buried beneath the mosque of Amr ibn al-As in Cairo, which uh, ended up being given by his widow to a British theologian. And I don't um, know its current location, so if you hear about it, let me know, please. Uh, and finally, some scrolls were acquired in circumstances explicitly shaped by the exercise of colonial power, such as the 18th century Algerian Torah scroll, which you see on the left, which was ripped in half during the French invasion of the Algerian city of Medea and taken by the French governor general back to France, one half still in France today, the other half randomly ending up at the University of Kansas. We're not quite sure how, but that's where it is. Uh, and then uh, my final example uh, is the growing market of Oriental manuscripts leading to specialized dealers, such as we've already heard about, focusing on supplying collectors with these rarities, many of which taken, were taken from Genizot and other repositories of discarded manuscripts. Palestine in particular, as it became a center for European tourism in the 19th century, was a common site for Torah scrolls to enter the manuscript collecting market. And perhaps no dealer is more famous or infamous for his sale of old Torah scrolls than Moses Wilhelm Shapira, about whom we will hear more tomorrow from uh, Doctors uh, Press and Jefferson. So I will leave his biography for that discussion. What I want to highlight uh, at the moment is that before the notorious Shapira affair, he had already established his reputation as a dealer in Hebrew manuscripts and especially in Torah scrolls. Initially, it seems he acquired his scrolls from local Jewish communities in Palestine, uh, and uh, a significant number brought by Yemenite Jewish immigrants. Uh, uh, 
And since by the 19th century, the Jews of Yemen already had a reputation among scholars, both Jewish and Christian, as an ancient community which conserved the traditions of biblical antiquity, this made these scrolls particularly attractive. For example, the missionary Joseph Wolf wrote in the mid-19th century, and I quote, the acquaintance of the Jews of Yemen must be of the highest importance to all the friends of Israel, meaning missionaries. They are the descendants of those Jews taken from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, and no Jews whom I ever saw had such Abrahamic countenances as those of Yemen, end quote. Already in the 1820s, a Torah scroll from Yemen was in the collection of the Duke of Sussex in England, celebrated as probably, and again I quote, probably the most ancient and most perfect manuscript of the Pentateuch in England, uh, and several European manuscript hunters attempted, not always successfully, to travel in Yemen to seek out ancient uh, Hebrew and Arabic texts. Uh, I thus suspect that Shapira saw how the Yemenite manuscripts he sold received an especially enthusiastic response, and he endeavored specifically to acquire more, including a trip to Yemen. And he presented these Yemenite scrolls as uniquely divergent from the standard rabbinic tradition in ways that would be very attractive to Christian buyers. Already in uh, 1872, the British explorers Palmer and Drake that we just uh, heard about uh, described learning uh, about Torah scrolls from Shapira in Jerusalem, emphasizing, and I quote here from, from their book, uh, how the rolls from Arabia frequently differ from the Talmudical regulations, end quote. One such Yemenite scroll, which is number 13 uh, in Shapira's handwritten catalog and sold subsequently to the Stats Bibliothek, it's now uh, here, Oriental Folio 1209, uh, and it was given three underlined strokes in his listing uh, on the left, which you see under the number 13, three strokes, which he explained meant a manuscript of special interest. And in his description of the scroll, he emphasizes how this old scroll happily, as he says, seems to diverge in many cases from the doctrine of the Talmud, and thus implying that it is perhaps very old, perhaps even uh, pre-Talmudic, and thus a link to the ancient biblical traditions of antiquity, uh, which it is not, but, uh, but that was the idea that he was hoping for, I think. So in the case of this scroll, and I think Shapira's scrolls in general, we actually see all three aspects of the Torah scroll collecting that I've identified coming together. Scrolls as souvenirs of travels in the Orient, and particular the Orientalist stereotype of Yemenite Jews as repositories of ancient manuscripts. Scrolls as symbols of Judaism and uh, the material appearance of the Bible in antiquity. And finally, scrolls as potential tools of scholarship and insight into the history of the biblical text. So this brings me to my conclusions for today. Surveying the provenance of the Torah scrolls here in the Staatsbibliothek and in uh, early modern German collections in general, we have seen how they bring to light a series of contradictions at the heart of European Christian scholarship uh, on Judaism. Judaism is, on the one hand, superstitious, Talmudical, and removed from the truth of the Bible. But, on the other hand, it is also authentic, unchanging, and desperately needed as a point of access to the visual and material authenticity of the biblical past. Ironically, while the corpus of Torah scrolls collected by Christians over the last five centuries may have been intended to illustrate Judaism's frozen antiquity, their paleographic, codicological, and ornamental diversity is in fact an untapped resource to demonstrate the evolving material transformations of Torah scrolls since the Middle Ages and the various diverse customs and practices of the Jewish communities who made and used them around the world. Dankeschön.